Well, a very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the Royal Academy. And we're indeed very grateful to all our speakers uh, and guests for making the time to be with us for this event. Now, we have a strong record in the UK of engineering innovation. And as the National Academy for Engineering, much of our work is, is very much focused on supporting and promoting innovation. We're currently running our campaign, Engineering for Growth, alongside partners from across industry, universities, and government departments. And together, we're working to highlight the contribution of engineering to the economy, to society, to health and well-being of the nation. And as an academy, we manage programs of research that are heavily supported by industries at the forefront of innovative engineering in the country. And we provide prizes and awards for great innovation, including the Queen Elizabeth Prize, the £1 million biannual prize, our major international award, and the McRobert Prize, the UK's top innovation award. In April of last year, the Academy launched our Enterprise Hub, which is providing a raft of support from over 70 of our Academy fellows to the best technology startups. The Academy also runs a comprehensive program of schemes to encourage engineering research and to facilitate closer contacts between industry and the academic world. We're currently supporting 10 appointments in the area of energy research. The appointments are spread across various Academy research schemes, such as Research Chair, Research Fellowship, the Lever Hume Trust Senior Research Fellowships, Industrial Secondment, and the MOD Research Fellowship, respectfully. We do a lot more besides, including our policy studies on specific technologies and their application, and our support for the nation's engineering skill base and our policy advice to government. Energy policy has been a focus of late. Last year, we undertook a study for the Committee of Science and Technology on electricity capacity margins on the GB system uh, over next winter 2014-15, where we believe the margins could become uh, overly narrow. On the 9th of April, we shall be launching a study on the implications of large-scale deployment of wind energy on the UK system, uh, including offshore wind. In all of our advice on energy, we come back to the need for UK energy policy to adopt a systems approach to addressing the trilemma and in achieving a secure, affordable, low carbon energy supply. Government has to appreciate the enormous challenge in delivering a low carbon energy system. Today's seminar is actually part of an innovation series in which we have covered innovation in construction, innovation in business systems, innovation in the auto industry, innovation in medical engineering, innovation in materials, today innovation in energy, and sometime in the not too distant future, innovation in aerospace. Our terrific lineup of speakers join us from a range of industries, organization, and academic institutions working across the energy sector. And they will share with us pioneering technologies, inventive processes, and novel modeling systems. After each presentation, you will have the opportunity to perhaps ask one or two questions for clarification, if time permits. But at the end of each uh, session, I will also ask the speakers to join me on the stage for a more in-depth question and answer session. So if you don't get a chance after the speaker speaks, you will after the group of three have done so. The event is being filmed uh, for the Academy's website. The refreshment break will take place in both rooms next door. That's there and here. And... Uh, the drinks reception afterwards will take place on the ground floor where some of the speakers here today 
have their work also on display, which I know you will enjoy. We have not been informed of any scheduled fire drills. If the alarm goes off, it's for real. Please follow the Academy staff who will direct you to the nearest exit. If you wish to use Twitter to report the event live, please use the hashtag shown on the screen. And for those of you whose eyesight might be challenged at the back, it's hash R-A-E in caps N-G lowercase, innovate lowercase. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, our first session today is on innovation, as I say, in the energy systems and transmissions. And in this session, we shall hear from three speakers on modelling the UK energy system, high voltage direct current and power to gas. And that will take us to our tea break. And the first session is entitled, first presentation is entitled, Modelling the UK Energy System, Practical Insights for Technology Development and Policy Making. And we start with Jo Coleman, whom I have great pleasure to introduce. She is the Acting Strategy Director at the Energy Technologies Institute. And Jo has joined the ETI in 2011 after some 20 years in the oil and gas industry. And she is responsible for the ongoing shape of ETI's technology strategy. Joe will talk about the ETI's energy system modeling environment. And as a model of the UK energy system, it allows a system-wide perspective to be taken. She will discuss how it is being used to make informed choices and provide evidence to policymakers and investors. Please give Joe Coleman a warm reception. Thank you, John, and thank you to the organisers for inviting me here today. Um, as John said, I'm going to talk to you about uh, modelling the UK energy system, how our modelling and analysis informs policy um, and our technology development choices, and then I'm going to share with you some of the key learnings we have from that. I think it's worth just saying a little bit about the ETI, because I'm guessing that some of you may not have heard of us. Um, but we are a public-private partnership between the UK government and six energy and engineering companies. And we're tasked with accelerating the development of affordable, low-carbon technologies in support of the UK's climate change targets. So um, very much um, in line with the theme of affordability, security um, and low carbon that John was talking about earlier. At the ETI, we think about the energy system in a whole systems approach, as John was mentioning. Um, so that's not just about electricity, but also around heat, and particularly the way we heat our homes, about our vehicles and how we're going to fuel our vehicles in the future, about industry, and more importantly, about the infrastructure that connects them all together. And today, they're quite segmented in a way. There isn't an awful lot of overlap between the different sectors of, of what we term energy. In the future, and as we think about various solutions for decarbonisation, there will be an awful lot more um, overlap between the sectors. So decisions we make, for example, in our choice of vehicles will impact in the electricity sector and similarly in the way we heat our homes. So understanding these interplays between sectors is crucially important. And as we look at infrastructure, what we see is that if we look backwards from 2050, and I think we all know and understand how difficult and how timely it is to roll out new infrastructures. But looking backwards from 2050, we need to be very seriously deploying new infrastructures if we are to meet the climate change targets by 2050. We need to be seriously in deployment mode by the mid-2020s. And if we look forward from today at the myriad of different choices we have available to us as to what those infrastructures will look like, we can't afford to be developing all of them um, on the basis that any, any technology solution might come forward and play. It's going to be too expensive. Um, and we're going to end up with redundant infrastructure and things that we, it's almost like the Betamax VHS um, debate of a number of years ago that some of you will remember. And so looking forwards from today, what we see is that we have about a decade 
to develop our options in order to be able to make some serious national decisions around the infrastructure we want to support. And in some respects, a decade can seem like a long period of time. Um, but for those of you who have been involved in any major infrastructure developments, or, or even if you think about the building of a new power station, um, they are long, it takes a long time to get those investments um, to actually happen, to, to be built, to be operating, and for us to be able to learn from them. So I'll say a little bit more about our modeling and how we approach it. Um, as I said, it's a whole systems approach, so it incorporates all the different elements of the energy system. And whilst we do this at a sort of, a, a, at a high level, we also have some 50 odd models um, developed by the ETI that look at very sector specific issues, um, both cost models, uh, process engineering, process simulation models, techno-economic analysis models that help to inform the numerics and the assumptions that we make um, in our energy system modeling environment. Our approach to modeling is to look at, for the lowest cost solutions that will meet um, our uh, demands for energy and at the same time offer a secure system um, that is low carbon. So we focus on finding the lowest cost solution and then look at what policies are required to deliver that rather than the other way around. And when we think about the energy system, of course, there's, there's just a huge amount of uncertainty in what the future will look like, both in terms of the availability of our resources, the cost of our resources, um, how quickly our technologies will develop, um, whether the performance of them will improve and the cost will come down. And so when we look at solutions for the energy system, we need to look for solutions that are robust against the range of outcomes. So considering the different uh, the range of assumptions, the range of outcomes is hugely important. Um, it's important we look at the geographical nature of the UK, the spatial elements. So if we build offshore wind, for example, off the west of Scotland, but our major demand centres are in the south of England, we need to consider the infrastructure and the transmission network required to connect the two together. Um, we also need to consider the way our demand changes over time. So I'm going to show you a couple of ch charts later that are annual average charts, but you need to remember that our demand um, varies hugely over time, both seasonally, but also in the time of day. And um, one number I really like to quote on this is the rate at which our gas demand, or our heating demand, can, can raise on a cold winter's morning. And there have been examples where that has increased at a rate of 130 gigawatts of heat demand in a single hour. Now that lasts for about an hour and then it drops off again. Now contrast that with our electricity system capacity of around 70 to 80 gigawatts and you can see the tremendous challenge that we have in the heat and how we deliver our heat in the future in comparison with what we tend to be focused on today, decarbonising our electricity sector. Um, our modelling, we use our modelling, so why do we do all of this? Um, we do it in order to inform our choices at the ETI in terms of what technologies we will invest in, what projects we will put our money and our members' money into. Um, but the government, in the form of uh, the Department for Energy for Climate Change and also the CCC, they use our models um, with their own assumptions as well as with our assumptions um, in some of their key policy work that's ongoing at the moment, including the, um, the update to the fourth carbon budget. Um, we also do specific projects with um, academic institutes um, who often have more resources to spend on this than, than we can do within the limits of our own organisation. And as well as inputting directly to policy, um, we also uh, provide evidence at um, or and, and respond to government calls for consultations um, and our work is heavily cited by others in their own responses to consultations and uh, providing of evidence. So what do we learn about the energy system and the way we might decarbonise it over the future? I think the first thing and, and probably the most important is that we can afford to decarbonise the energy system. Um, over the period to 2050 it probably costs about 1% of GDP. Um, that's a little more than we spend on overseas aid. Um, and I'm not suggesting we should, we should swap it for overseas aid, but it's a relatively small part of our overall um, expenditure as a country. 
But there are two provisos to that statement that we can afford it. Um, one is that we have to design a system that's basically optimal in its approach. So it won't happen by chance. And the other one, and drawing on John's comment about innovation earlier, is that it requires further investment in innovation and R&D to drive down costs and improve performance of the technologies that will play a key role in the future. Now, this picture here, this sh is showing you um, in terms of NPV, net present value, the additional cost of delivering the 2050 energy system, um, a low carbon energy system, against, if you like, the baseline of what it will cost us anyway to deliver an energy system regardless of climate change targets. Um, and on the right hand side of it, you see four key packages, if you like, of technologies. And it's showing you the additional cost of delivering the energy system if you take any one of these technologies away. And these are probably the four biggest packages of technologies we see as having impact in the future energy system. And you see from this that both CCS and biomass, bioenergy, come out <coughs> as the, the most valuable technologies that we can potentially deploy in the energy system. Now, it probably um, doesn't sort of, uh, you, you've probably observed looking at this that we haven't yet demonstrated a CCS project. Uh, we haven't built a new nuclear plant for a couple of decades. We're not doing all that well at um, deploying low carbon technologies in our buildings and we're pretty non-existent in terms of biomass um, deployment and development in the UK. So whilst these look like very key technologies today, until we've proven and developed them, and that by proven I don't just mean technically, but also the business models, the policy, the regulation required to deliver these at scale, we can't yet rely on these as the solutions. We need to keep all our options open, we need to be putting money into the other technologies that aren't on this chart but are going to have a key role to, or potentially have a key role to play, particularly if one of these technologies doesn't materialise. And I'll show an example of that in a minute. I'm often asked why CCS is so valuable and why it comes out so high. And I think the misconception with CCS is that we see it as a potential solution in the power sector. And it is, but its role can go far beyond that. So as well as being a potential solution in the power sector, we can use CCS with biomass to generate so-called negative emissions. So essentially we use trees, plants, to absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, if we burn those plants in a sustainable manner, if we connect that with carbon capture and storage, we can um, effectively remove emissions from the atmosphere remove CO2 from the atmosphere and by doing so it enables us to perhaps prolong the use of fossil fuels in parts of the energy sector that are harder to decarbonize such as our heavy goods vehicles or our aeroplanes um, or some of our very hard to um, uh, retro retrofit houses. We can also use CCS to generate new energy vectors such as synthetic natural gas and hydrogen. And finally, we can use CCS in industry. So there are very few ways in which we can decarbonize some of our heavy industry, but CCS provides one of them. So really the value of CCS is largely outside the power sector, but the route to delivering and proving CCS is within the power sector. But as we go forward with developing it, we need to be thinking about how we extend its rollout beyond the power sector. Now, the next chart is a fairly complicated picture, and you don't need to follow all the lines. Um, but this is showing you an annual average um, flow of energy in 2050. Um, and for those who want to know, the chart is called a Sankey diagram. And in this world, you can see that there is still quite a significant role for fossil fuels, the, the, for those who can't see that. Here, the bit at the bottom. We can also see the green line going across and, and the many different arrows and different directions in which biomass can flow. But really the point about this chart is that if you look to the right and to the centre of it, there are an awful lot of new pipes and wires 
We've got synthetic natural gas in there, we've got hydrogen in there, we've got district heating, new pipes and wires carrying new energy vectors from new points of generation to new end use demands. And that's a considerable amount of new infrastructure required. Now if I look at exactly the same energy system, but now I take away the option of, of deploying CCS, you see here that it looks entirely different. There is now a very small role for fossil fuels. Biomass is almost entirely used in liquid fuel production for our vehicles. There is now a massive role for electrolysis to produce hydrogen from the very large amount of excess renewables we'll have at certain times of year. It's very, very different. And I'm not necessarily saying either is right or wrong, better or worse. They're just different. The point is they require very different infrastructure. And so we need to make decisions around some of these potentially key parts of the energy system like CCS in order to be able to make decisions about which infrastructure to deploy. So what's this going to take over the next decade? It's going to require um, a fair amount of what we call preparedness or preparing. And preparing is not just doing studies, um, you know, desktop studies and, and modeling. Preparing is about actually getting out there and building stuff. Because we need to build stuff to be able to provide confidence to investors um, that we can then uh, deliver this sort of and the rollout of it beyond the next decade. It also involves driving down costs, so we should be, whilst we should be deploying technologies, our focus should be on, uh, on driving down cost, rather than necessarily on large-scale deployment, to inform our choices. So in summary, the transition to a low-carbon energy system is affordable, as long as we make the right choices. CCS and bioenergy appear to be key enablers in this world. And we need to be able to make national decisions about those around the middle of the 2020s. I'm not too hung up about the date. But around the middle of the 2020s, in order that we can make the decisions to that allow us to optimise our infrastructure um, and go forward successfully to 2050. But there is a lot to be done. Um, and whilst we're, we need to develop these key technologies, we also need to develop the alternatives in case we're not successful with these key technologies. We need to develop plans for infrastructure in order to be able to start the rollout. We're also going to have to think about those technologies or those infrastructures that aren't going to have a role in the future. So what happens to the gas grid as we start to move areas into district heating, for example? What happens to our liquid fuels for our vehicles as we move more and more cars onto electricity or hydrogen fuel? There are decisions we have to make and they will impact us all in different ways depending on our position and our viewpoint on the energy system of the future. Thank you. Now we're going to move to high voltage direct current and Phil Shepherd, who's the head of network strategy at National Grid is going to be our next speaker. His key responsibilities at National Grid are leading the development of the future network strategies both for gas and the electricity transmission systems. And this, of course, includes network capability, capacity, operating strategies, and the preparedness of the need cases for major reinforcements <coughs> of the systems. Phil has broad experience in the industry across both transmission and gas distribution, and he'll be talking about the role of high voltage direct current in the Great Britain transmission system and the benefits this technology is delivering for stakeholders and future innovations. Phil. Just wait for the slides to be changed. Thank you very much for inviting me here this afternoon to talk about HVDC. Um, I'm going to cover a short overview of HVDC, the technology, um, some of the benefits, some of the challenges um, for future opportunities. Um, 
I'm going to cover it at a high level, um, some of the technology that's currently being applied and applied in the future, as well as some of the projects that are currently underway or in development. So as many of you know, um, electricity started in DC in some form. I was in the days where you had to generate exactly what the consumer is going to be using in the home. Um, over time, it became clear that AC is a much more practical solution. So I've just highlighted here um, the two different aspects, some of the, the key elements around um, where it's more cost effective to use AC, where it's more cost effective to use DC. Um, things around uh, the worldwide choice is probably um, AC, but effectively AC goes where the impedance goes. So it flows um, at the Whatever, whatever route has got the lowest impedance. So you, you change the flows with impedance. In DC, you have a control scheme. You can switch things on and off much more readily. So if you want a much more controllable flow, then uh, DC is the answer. When we're looking now at uh, the DC and the application of DC in transmission networks, uh, the benefits of, of DC, apart from the fact that controllable, it allows you to connect two areas of AC without using an AC network itself. So you can have two separate synchronous zones connected by a DC route. How that, that technology gets delivered, there are, are two types of technology. There's a current source converter and there's a voltage source converter. Sometimes voltage source converters are called HVDC light or HVDC plus, and sometimes C CSC is called uh, line commutated uh, converters. So effectively, the uh, CSC type have been in, in place in the, it, since the 1950s. Um, they effectively need an AC, uh, an AC signal, an AC source in order to, to trigger the thyristors. Um, they have relatively low losses. Um, however, they do have uh, create large harmonics. You have to have harmonic filters as a result of creating the harmonics because of the switching. Um, you also have to bear in mind the system strength at the receiving end. You can have commutation failures, which means the DC link itself fails under, under different operating conditions. Uh, they tend to have larger converter stations, and they can only operate effectively in an energized AC network. You can't use them to do a black start. Conversely, with a voltage source converter uh, in place since the late 90s, um, you can use a battery or a large capacitor as the source, so you don't need an, an energized AC source. Um, you can operate them, therefore, in grids with very low short circuit levels, so that really does work for offshore, uh, offshore wind. Um, you can have independent control of the reactive and the power. The harmonics are only seen at very high switching frequencies, so you end up with less harmonics, less filters for that. Um, they're about 40% smaller converter stations, so again, that really does play into an offshore network where you may want HVDC on platforms in the North Sea. Um, and another advantage, if you've linked them to, an a, uh, to another AC system, you can use them as a black start tool. So this is just showing some examples of uh, worldwide HVDC experience. Um, so you can see there are some uh, vastly huge um, systems um, in China, uh, 7,200 megawatt links. So these tend to be very long overhead lines, um, very long distances, and it's a very efficient way of transmitting energy over long distances. And they, they are current source technology because it just that, that suits the type of network that they're uh, built in. In the UK, um, we've just put up one example there, which I'll come into a bit more detail, which is the Western HVD Silink, which is capturing renewable energy in Scotland and transferring it through into the north of England, North Wales at Deeside. Um, and I'll give you a bit more example about why we're using that as a, a current source device and how embedding that inside the network is delivering benefits to consumers. So in this example, um, for those that you know the transmission network, electricity transmission network, there are two double circuits between England and Scotland. Uh, they've been in place for a very long time, but they started off with a relatively small capacity, about 1.2, 1.8 gigawatts of capacity across that network. Over the last 15 years, that's developed, um, and we've now got about 4 gigawatts transfer across that boundary. Uh, if you think around the Scottish demand, winter peak is about 5.5 gigawatts. Um, but actually there's a capability of much greater than that because of the amount of renewable energy that's being connected in Scotland. So as part of the reinforcements, there is an alternative um, to uh, putting a third double circuit overhead line from somewhere around Glasgow to somewhere around Liverpool or Manchester, 
which would be a huge task in itself. Um, we looked at installing a, an HVDC link. So it's an undersea HVDC link, so it avoids a lot of the onshore reinforcement issues. Um, it, it turns out that it is significantly cheaper than the AC solution. It's quicker to deploy because of the visual amenity and the planning aspects of trying to build an overhead line of that distance over that part of the network. It's got a, a shorter lead time because of all the consenting that you'd be required to do to build an overhead line, reduce visual impact. And we're pushing the boundaries of the current technology by having uh, a 600 kV cable. Um, so it's part of the development path. Um, one of the limitations of HVDC is, is the size of the cable, both the physical conductor size, the type of um, insulation that you use, and then the voltage that you can actually drive through that system. So this 2.2 gigawatt um, connection um, will be commissioned in 2016. We've paid some extra to have a, a short-term rating. Um, normally you don't get much of a short-term rating with HVDC links, it's one of the limitations of it. Um, but by a short-term rating, we can arrange for some overloads to be carried for a very short periods of time as we rebalance the network on the AC side. So this type of investment um, will allow us to get over six gigawatts of power from Scotland to England and Wales. So if you t think about a winter peak, there's probably about 12 gigawatts that could be generated in Scotland for self-consumption and exports to GB. Another application um, is looking at offshore wind farms. If you think that um, some of the wind farms are between 125 and 290 kilometres offshore, that's beyond the practical range for AC transmission at the moment. So the typical range of AC transmission that the cutover point between AC and DC offshore is about 80, 90 kilometres. Um, there's a new technology, low frequency AC, that might extend that a bit further, but for, for practical purposes today, um, these types of networks are going to be linked by HVDC that connect these very large wind farms offshore. It has the benefit that you can uh, have relatively small platforms. They are a VSC technology, allows you to have multi-terminal um, platforms. Uh, and by integrating these various offshore wind farms, you can reduce the number of cables from each wind farm to the shore to avoid having a radial network. And by having bootstraps between these different networks, you can avoid some onshore reinforcement. So again, it, it, it is more efficient um, it allows you more control and ultimately it saves money for the consumers. Some of the many aspects um, for those who are involved in um, power engineering is just the complexity of studying uh, the system, particularly if you're now looking at multi-terminal HVDC links. Um, up here are some of the, the aspects you need to consider, so some of the more esoteric forms of subsynchronous resonance, uh, subsynchronous torsional interaction between uh, some of the aspects of power electronics um, and the, the actual generator shafts themselves, as well as looking at what are the overall control schemes going to be doing. So if there are AC or DC faults, how do you detect them? How do you make sure you have low latency communications and control schemes that allow you to rebalance the network, isolate a faulted section without affecting the wider system? So in terms of what is the route map going forward, what are the, some of the innovations that we're looking for in order to help bring some of this to fruition? Certainly one of the key aspects um, are DC circuit breakers. At the moment when we're designing multi-terminal networks, um, they, they when you, if you're managing faults or managing flows, you have to look at large bits of the network. By improving uh, the current designs of um, DC, so they become commercially available DC circuit breakers. Um, it means you can isolate different parts of the network, smaller parts of the network, so both for faults and for maintenance and for managing flows, it becomes a lot more viable um, in the larger networks. So that becomes more important as I show you a, a slide towards the end. Uh, CSC inverters tend to be uh, quite efficient compared to uh, VSC, so reducing the losses um, is going to improve their viability. Um, a key aspect is ancillary services. So those are the services that we, we talk about as system operator that we would like to buy from providers. As the level of non-synchronous generation um, increases on the system, the amount of inertia is going to decrease. Uh, in order to manage that lower uh, amount of inertia, then we're looking for what you might call rapid frequency response, so not over seconds but over milliseconds, injecting more energy into the system. Um, also helps with voltage management to avoid things like voltage collapse that you have if you have a low system strength system. So in, in terms of innovation and research and development, um, National Grid are currently involved in about 30 projects. Uh, we're involved with numerous universities, um, 
Strathclyde, uh, Imperial, Manchester, um, there's a long list. I forget, but apologies to anybody I missed out who's in the audience. Um, but we're looking at modelling HVDC, modelling multi-terminal HVDC, looking at the control characteristics, how we can develop those, how we can make sure that if we have, for example, an HVDC interconnector in close proximity to either other HVDC interconnectors or uh, offshore wind, that we manage the control interaction between those so there's no adverse effects on the network. So just to bring to life um, some of the, the benefits, this is a, a project that we've been working with with developers, manufacturers and Ofgem. It's the Integrated Offshore Transmission uh, Project. So this is just showing um, against a 2030 uh, currently contracted position for generation for the third round offshore. So we're looking at Dogger Bank, Hornsey, um, East Anglia. Um, if you design those networks in isolation um, and had radial links coming into each one of those, the nearest piece of uh, onshore transmission network, um, you'll end up doing a lot of onshore reinforcement uh, in order to connect effectively the power that's landing at Grimsby all the way down to North London. By putting in the, the blue line around the, the periphery there from the top, somewhere around Grimsby perhaps, all the way down, you could effectively using the technologies available today, about one billion pounds in that time frame. If some of these uh, onshore wind farms connect later than currently contracted, <coughs> which in my personal view is likely, um, then actually the savings go up to between two and three billion pounds. And that's by integrating the HVDC technology into the AC systems that are offshore onto the onshore and avoid lots of onshore reinforcement. However, you do need some control schemes um, in order to make that work. So the integration of AC and offshore uh, control schemes can be very important for us. So just to start to, to bring this to a close, um, there are various uh, discussion groups, various uh, lobby groups, various uh, people thinking very seriously about how can we deliver benefits across Europe for consumers. So one of the ways of delivering um, uh, greater diversity of low carbon uh, generation is to interconnect large sources of low carbon generation, so water in, uh, in Norway or some of the, the wind that's in North Germany, um, Denmark, um, and those that are in the North Sea. So you can see here that at some point all these interconnectors could be brought together. So you start blurring the difference between an interconnector and a, 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 an AC offshore grid. Um, and by doing this, you can save significant amount of investment because you're, you're playing against the diversity of different, different types of generation at different timescales and different seasons. So there's currently work going in, in various routes in this, including in within the EU, but there's also the work that's being delivered by the uh, ETSOE, looking at the codes of the requirements of generations and the HVDC codes that are trying to bring this all together that can make this, if, if this can be demonstrated to be economic and efficient, that this is actually a good way forward. So just to bring to close, um, if you'd like some more information about HVDC, we've got something on our website, but you need to search for those words. If you search for HVDC, you'll find something different. This is the more helpful sheet. Um, hopefully, I've given you a bit of a flavour of um, some of the types of HVDC, some of the opportunities, some of the benefits, some of the challenges that exist in the industry going forward. One of the key aspects for us as National Grid when we're making offers to customers, to generators, is trying to get the balance right between using existing technology that's known and proven it tends to be a bit more expensive compared to the cost of using something that is in development, a little bit less certain, but may cost less. It comes back to our role um, in the industry is to make sure that we, what we do is economic and efficient. And we look at making sure that our investments in infrastructure, we don't overinvest in infrastructure, we don't strand assets. On the other hand, if we leave it too late, we end up with constraints on the system and end up that consumers pay um, congestion charges. So by using this technology, we're looking at innovation and looking how we can deliver this. Um, we're looking to make sure that we maximise the benefits of this technology for consumers. So thank you. So now we are going to move to power to gas, storing renewable energy in the gas grid. And we are going to hear from Dr. Graham Cooley, who is the Chief Executive of ITM Power. Graham joined ITM Power as CEO in 2009, and before that he was the Business Development Manager in National Power and spent 11 years in the power industry developing energy storage and generation technologies. And his presentation will outline the principles 
of energy storage, grid balancing and demand side management and the role that hydrogen can play in improving utilization of renewable power. So, Graham. Yeah, I think I'm on. Okay, so uh, thanks very much for inviting me here to talk about power to gas um, energy storage. Um, I'm going to start by talking about a uh, little bit introduction to ITM power, then say something very briefly about the need for energy storage, say something about the rationale for power to gas energy storage and how it all works, and then talk very briefly about um, our project with the Tuga Group in Germany um, so you can see that we are actually getting on and building some equipment, and then a summary at the end. So just a bit about ITM Power, first of all. Uh, we were the first um, hydrogen and fuel cell related company to be uh, listed on the London stock market, actually on the AIM market, which has its advantages and also its disadvantages. Um, we uh, IPO'd, had a secondary, and have raised um, over the last couple of years around 17 million for expansion. Expansion particularly um, in Germany and the US. And we've established um, ITM Power GmbH in Germany and ITM Power Inc. Um, in the USA. And, and we're um, an unusual company for a new technology company. We actually make things. So um, we're an engineering company uh, based in Sheffield and we have a manufacturing business model. So our interest is in um, hydrogen energy systems for energy storage and also for clean fuel. I'm going to talk to you now today about the energy storage part. We also make refueling stations for hydrogen electric vehicles. Um, we make full systems, so that is an integrated system which is CE marked. It's been through all the compliance directives that are required and they are A, for sale and B, selling very well. We have an order book of about two million and projects under contract of around four and a half million. Um, and a very significantly developing pipeline. So uh, what we make and why it's unique then, so in the middle you can see an electrolyzer system. It's packaged in a 20-foot ISO container. They're the shipping containers that you see going up and down the motorway. Um, two things that are unique about the electrolyzer, one is it responds in less than one second. So it qualifies for frequency control by demand management payments um, already published by National Grid, which are a sub two second response payment. Um, and in fact, we're working with um, AEG to get that response time down. The stacks will respond in uh, one fifth of a second, which is 10 cycles. And we're looking at a single cycle response from the front end power electronics. So we're interested in uh, grid balancing, we're also interested in connecting directly to renewable power, which you can't do with conventional electrolyzers. Um, the older alkaline electrolyzers, you turn them on, you run them up very slowly, and then you have to leave them on. You can't turn them off. So this is rapid response, and it's a rapid response demand side load. In terms of putting hydrogen into the gas grid, the other advantage is that they're high pressure electrolyzers. So we make hydrogen at 80 bar, um, which is slightly higher than the pressure of the high pressure gas grid all over Europe. So we can inject hydrogen directly into the gas grid without a buffer store or any compression. So it's a direct transducer between balancing renewable power and making a renewable gas that you put straight into the gas grid. Uh, technology then, it's uh, fully CE marked. Um, what you see there is an ATEX space. It's been through the pressure equipment, low voltage EMC directives. We work with AEG, they're the market leader in um, uh, AC-DC converters, rapid response AC-DC converters. And at the other end of the container where we're generating the hydrogen, we work with NRM, who are the state gas utility in Hessen, um, to make the mixing plant, the compliant mixing plant for injecting hydrogen um, into the gas grid. Um, and I'll explain the reason for NRM a bit later. 
So let's talk about the need for energy storage. Um, so I've spent a long time being interested in energy storage. Um, I, I started developing a technology called Regenesis at National Power in 1992. And, and back then, I would say energy storage was a, a technology push. It was a very interesting thing that you could do for turning a uh, mid-merit plant into baseload plant. Today, energy storage has what you might call its killer application, which is uh, renewable power. Uh, and um, today, it's without a doubt a market pull. So we have power utilities all over the world contacting us about power to gas energy storage. So why do you need energy storage if you've got renewable power? So here's a very simple example of the reason you need energy storage. Th this is uh, um, the plan for us planting up of, of on and offshore wind in the UK. So the offshore um, is in red and the onshore is in blue. And we hit this m magic threshold of 20% by capacity or around 8% by energy. And at that point, uh, the experience from Germany and Denmark and now Spain is that you, need, you end up turning down a considerable amount of wind power. A very simple example might be that in the UK we run 40% base load. So 40% of our power stations, you turn them on and you leave them on, you don't turn them off. Okay, if you've got 20% by capacity wind and the wind blows up um, all over the UK at night, then you'd have to turn off half of the base load. And the question is, can you do that? And they certainly don't do that in Germany and Denmark. Here's the reason why. This is a national grid slide of the length of time it takes to re-energize a power station once you've turned it off. And you've got anything between two days and six hours. Okay, so for security of supply, if you have wind, you don't know whether you've got it for a few minutes or a few hours, and so you can't turn off the base load. So what you do is curtail the wind power. Now another thing you can do, rather than turn down the wind power, is turn on a load. Okay, that's a thing called demand side management, where you turn on and off assets on the demand side. And, and our particular demand side manageable load is an electrolyzer. You turn it on when you're balancing against renewable power and you make something useful. You actually make a renewable gas that you can put directly into the gas grid. So is it a real market today? Well, National Grid spent 0.7 billion on grid balancing services 2010-11 financial year. Last year they spent 1.1 billion um, and the estimates across the industry vary from 2 billion to 6 billion for grid balancing services. Now what you want is more and more rapid response demand side loads because um, as Phil rightly pointed out, as you reduce the amount of inertia in the network, you need more and more demand side management. So here's the overall rationale for power to gas energy storage. What you see is the two largest energy networks in any developed country. That's the electricity network and the gas network. So the electricity network in the UK has 350 terawatt hours of energy flowing through it. Actually the, the um, gas network has 1,000 terawatt hours flowing through it. So our gas grid is three times the size of our electricity grid in terms of energy. The difference between the gas grid and the electricity grid is the gas grid has lots of storage. So we already own a huge asset for storing energy. It's called the gas grid. And a fantastic place to put excess renewable electricity is into the gas grid in the form of renewable gas. So you can see the more and more uh, um, renewable power you have, the more difficult it is to manage a network with no storage. You use an electrolyzer to balance against the renewable power and you make hydrogen, you put that straight into the gas grid. Hydrogen is very miscible uh, with methane. Or you can react it with CO2 and make synthetic natural gas and put that straight into the gas grid. And the numbers are very, very large. 
So if you look at all the different energy storage technologies that are available, energy storage in general is segmented by discharge time and energy storage size. Very standard way of doing it. If you want an extremely short burst of energy, um, in fact less than a cycle for power quality work, then you use a flywheel. If you want two hours of energy storage, you use a battery. Problem with batteries is that all the energy is stored inside the battery. So if you want four hours of energy storage, you have to buy another battery. With hydrogen, the energy rating and the, uh, and the power rating are separated. So um, you buy an electrolyzer, you can run it as long as you want, and you put the hydrogen into the gas grid, which is a huge hydrogen tank that we already own. So all you do is buy the conversion part not the energy storage part. And there we are, you can see with um, power to gas, you're looking at uh, gigawatt hours, terawatt hours, you're looking at annual or seasonal energy storage rather than hours of energy storage. The numbers are big, so if you look at our 2020 target for wind and you only curtail 4% of that, that's 2.8 terawatt hours of energy. Uh, which is a lot of electrolysis, but only half a percent of hydrogen in the gas grid. So it shows you, one, how big the gas grid is, and also what a um, very practical store it is for renewable energy. How much hydrogen can you put in the gas grid? So um, th there is a limit, which is referred to as the Dutton limit, a gentleman at British Gas who did all the calculations for gas interchangeability when we changed in the UK from town gas to natural gas, which was in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and we used to run a gas system, of course, which had 60% hydrogen in it. So today, um, that limit is around 12%. And Holland have adopted the Dutton limit. Germany are at 10%. Most of Europe are clustered around 5%. And we've recommended that the 0.1% limit in the UK is changed to 3%. So here's a shanky diagram of gas. Actually, it's always surprising to see that we import half of all of our gas in the UK. We then re-export 10% of it. Uh, some of it goes to power generation, but the bulk of it goes to heat goes to industrial and domestic heat. So actually if you inject hydrogen made from renewable power into the gas grid, you are providing renewable heat on a very large scale. Okay, that's a Shanky diagram. One of the limitations of Shanky diagrams is that they're not time resolved. So here's a time resolved diagram of heat and electricity together. So you see the blue line running through the back is our demand in the UK for gas. That's our demand for energy that ends up as heat. And the little red line buzzing along the front is electricity. Okay, at some points in the year, the demand and the amount of energy flowing through the gas grid is five and a half times as much as the electricity grid. So people say, well, why don't we just decarbonize electricity and then electrify heat. Just won't work. The scale is much too high. And the variability is too much seasonally. But one thing you can do is store any excess electricity that you might have from renewable power in the electricity part in the gas grid, because there's a huge amount of latent overcapacity. Um, renewable heat then, well the government is saying we want 12% of all of our heating by, from renewables by 2020. It's a very, very ambitious target. I think one of the routes to it um, is power to gas energy storage, but it will require a lot of electrolysis. 2018.6 uh, uh, gigawatts of, of um, electrolysis. So what are the elements of value then? Well, to the power network, you're looking at reducing the amount of renewables curtailment and also reducing the reliance um, on open cycle gas for grid balancing 
Uh, for the gas grid, you're looking at decarbonising and the provision of renewable heat. Um, also, of course, now in everybody's minds, you're making gas domestically from an excess product, and that's quite good from a, um, uh, a fuel and energy security uh, point of view. So uh, uh, let me just um, show you a few slides on our Tuga project before I finish. Um, so the Tuga is the largest grouping of power and gas utilities in Germany. In fact, it's the whole of the utilities sector, pretty much. Um, 100 utilities in that grouping, massive amount of customers. So for us, it was a, a, um, a fantastic first customer for a major scheme. It's one third of a megawatt in size. Uh, we won a competitive tender and we won on cost and on performance. Uh, we were given the order in March. Uh, we delivered the plant on the ground um, early. We were given the target to inject hydrogen into the German gas grid uh, by the end of 2013. We did it the first week in December, so we delivered three weeks early on a nine-month project, which pleased the Germans because working with the German engineers, uh, um, everything is very, very well planned. Uh, we had to design and build a plant that was fully CE marked. That means it's gone through all of the European directives. Uh, get uh, sign off from the power company, but also get a permit to operate from Tufsud. We do all of those things. This is the technical file. Um, it's sometimes a surprise to people who are developing technologies what is required to get a CE mark. That's just the technical file. That's lever arch files in boxes. Every single component has to be certified. Uh, the Tuga group, um, having 100 uh, members, uh, it's a very good way of engaging with the whole industry. What you see in the photograph is the rapid response electrolyzer at the front. Uh, next to it, the compliant mixing plant that was built by the gas company in Hessen. We now partner with them to bid that mixing plant worldwide. And the Tuga built as a visitor centre around the control room so that all of their members can come and make measurements on the plant. So we also joined the German Energy Agency's Power to Gas strategic platform. That's the German government bringing together all of the players and planning the rollout of Power to Gas energy storage. And uh, we're the only non-German company to have been invited into that platform. And then finally, we did a project called uh, Grid Gas. Um, it was a TSB-funded project to make recommendations to DEC and the HSE. Uh, we did that with National Grid, SSE, Shell, and the compliance body, Kiwa. Um, there's a website, so you can go and have a look at uh, uh, the, um, the project. And here's the recommendations that we made. Basically, it says we should bring together stakeholders to analyze power to gas energy storage to look at what a feed-in tariff might look like for hydrogen into the gas grid and its equivalence with biomethane. And we also made recommendations to the HSE about the levels of hydrogen uh, that would be um, considered safe in the gas grid. So um, that's the end of my talk, just to say uh, renewable power needs energy storage. Power to gas is on the required scale. Um, and um, power to gas not only stores excess renewable power, uh, but it also produces renewable heat. Thanks very much. Well, I think we've... Uh got our three speakers now on the platform so we can start taking questions and uh, I'm sure you have quite a number you would like to put to the panel. So who's going to kick off? Yes. Second row. Should we have the microphone just one second? Yep. Yeah, I think it's good. Okay. Um, Gary Hayes, HGN Capital. Graham, uh, nice to see you again. Thank you. Um, 
six, we were doing hydrogen storage at Imperial Chemical Industries using the old alkaline. Yeah. Uh, we've still got a million cubic meters of hydrogen there mm -hmm. and proposed the hydrogen highway. Why isn't it being done today? By hydrogen highway, you mean hydrogen for transport? Well, for east to west, so across to Cheshire from Teesside. Okay. Um, so um, I, I look at two things, energy storage and fuel, first of all. So um, a, a fuel for hydrogen vehicles is now a very significant project with the UK government. It's called UK H2 Mobility. Um, so that's with um, um, ITM Power and Elekid and BOC Linda as the hydrogen uh, providers um, and all the car companies. So most of the OEMs are in it. We, we've had at the first um, hydrogen, full hydrogen fuel cell vehicle has now been released, which is the Hyundai iX35. You've got the Toyota vehicle coming out next year, um, and um, all of the OEMs are now rolling out those hydrogen vehicles. So hydrogen infrastructure is without a doubt here. Uh, we have, um, uh, we're building two refueling stations in the UK. We have two existing ones. And we're looking at rolling out um, over the next couple of years 65 refilling stations under that program. So it really is happening now in terms of uh, refueling. The, the pipeline that you're um, talking about and the hydrogen resource, um, there are a number of hydrogen resources in the UK. Um, there's off gas from Runcorn, uh, there's um, the hydrogen uh, around Teesside. Uh, that's actually not quite pure enough for hydrogen vehicles, it's only five nines purity. Uh, but um, with, with uh, clean up technology, you can use it. So why didn't it happen? I think um, earlier on, I think first of all, the government wasn't behind it and it is now, and the cars weren't here and they are now. Yes. Uh, John, John Lowe, Sir Henry Royce Memorial Foundation. One of the issues that we typically have is lack of public understanding. Um, you've got an issue here, and I can see people uh, doing the usual problems of uh, over-exaggerating the risks, etc. And perhaps some, uh, some uh, explanation uh, um, demonstrators might be helpful. Uh, is ITM considering um, uh, how you're going to convince the public up front before they understand uh, uh, the wrong things about this technology. We have some suggestions as to how we might help you. Yeah, su suggestions are always welcomed. Uh, um, I mean, the first thing to say is we used to run a gas grid with 60% hydrogen in it, um, and that's hydrogen mixed with carbon monoxide, which is more difficult for the public than hydrogen mixed with methane. Um, hydrogen and methane are completely miscible with each other. Um, and, um, you know, if you're, you're around 10%, the flame speed is the same, the Wobby index is the same as well. That's all the work that that gentleman at British Gas did. So um, I, I um, co convincing the general public and not having hairs running that are um, spurious is, is, is an elegant challenge in energy. It always is. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, it, it, it's hydrogen implicitly is a very, very safe fuel. Um, if you look at hydrogen in vehicles, if you pierce a hydrogen tank, the hydrogen is gone in seconds. You're not engulfed in flames like you are with a liquid fuel. Um, and so uh, the HSE um, in the US refer to it as a, a fuel they want to move to because of its safety. Because it, it's so light, it disappears immediately. Graham, you mentioned the 0.1% limit on the UK. Yeah. What was the equivalent one in Germany? I didn't pick it up from the graph. So Germany, you can put up to 10% unless you're near a station where you're off taking gas for um, vehicles. Um, the, our 0.1% actually comes from uh, the market entry rules for gas because we import so much gas. You know, interestingly, we're, because we're in an international network, inevitably we're going to end up with hydrogen, with, um, methane with, with hydrogen in it anyway. Um, so we need to adopt the international standards, whether we intend to do the injections ourselves or not. 
Phil, any comments from a grid point of view? Uh, <coughs> maintaining the gas quality is very important for everybody and, and making sure we've got international standards it is a piece of work that's ongoing at the moment to work out how we can take what we currently enjoy in the UK to something that is more practical across, um, across Europe. Yeah. Yes. Good if you gave your name each time. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, thank you. Mark Selby, Sarah's Power. I, I think all the speakers have touched on it, that there's a very sort of disparate nature of um, all the different value drivers for the various technologies. And particularly with small-scale distributed technologies, Graham made the point that there were lots of different sources of value. So um, what's the view of the panel on the, the different business models that allow um, distributed demand-side technologies to, to access the value that they inherently create. I mean, it's particularly important for ITM, but I think strategically it's also important. Bill, would you like to have a go at that? Or would I, you not? No, I will. Um, it, it's a difficult, it is a challenge, um, big challenge. I think we need a market and business models that value I mean, at the moment, sorry, at the moment we pay the same price for our electricity whatever time of day um, we get it. Now, clearly there are times when um, it's harder to produce or there's more of a shortage of supply. Currently what we pay in households doesn't reflect that at all. So a market that values uh, the time at which a technology can deliver energy against the amount of demand for that energy is important and I think that's something we need to move to and then energy storage comes into its own because then because storage pr provides whether it's hydrogen or whether it's electricity storage it feeds back into the system at the time when you most want it and it's produced at times when we are supplying too much energy so when Graham's describing you know his renewable situation at the time when he's producing hydrogen, effectively the value of that renewable electricity is zero. And there are examples in Germany now where it's negative because there's just too much supply. But in the UK at the moment, what we as residential consumers pay doesn't in any way reflect that. So to me, that's one of the key things we need to value these um, technologies. Any other comments from the panel on that question? Yeah, I mean, I think you need a portfolio of technologies. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you do in a domestic environment takes out a peak before it happens, which is the, the most peakiest places, of course, the, uh, right at the end of the chain. Um, so you, uh, I think you, you need a portfolio of solutions. I, I think in terms of energy storage, valuing energy storage in the energy storage services has always been a challenge. And, and there's a vast amount of things you get from energy storage that are difficult to value. Okay, it's about how you run a portfolio of plant which is difficult to value. Um, it's about frequency work. It's about VAR flow work and stabilizing voltage. It can be about black start. It can be about lots of these things all at once. And, and as, you, as you take off conventional plant from the network, particularly coal, you, you lose the inertia of those great big steam chests and, and it's also about system stability for that reason. And, and I think the loss of inertia in the power network is a key thing that no one seems to talk about. There's another reason for having energy storage. So I'd like to talk about losing inertia in the system, um, something that, that is very meaningful for us. So every year we, uh, we publish future energy scenarios as part of our stakeholder consultation process. And that looks at how the energy market's going to uh, evolve between now and 2035 and 2050. As part of that work, we then look at infrastructure, but also how the system characteristics are changing. So as we get more non-synchronous generation, so wind, solar, onto the system, um, you can see inertia is dropping over time. So uh, reflecting back to the point around flexibility, in the future, um, once we get towards 2020, um, there will be a lot more value in future. So we are going to be relying on things like uh, smart meters, smart grids, smart markets, in order to value that flexibility, that time of day. And then that allows aggregators and other providers to provide services that we're going to need to offset some of that uh, change in system quality um, because of that, that drop in inertia, which changes both system strength as well as inertia. So accessing that supply chain, um, certainly from our perspective, we'll, as National Grid, we'll be expecting to buy lots of services over that time frame. And we publish some of this, uh, uh, these views in our electricity tenure statement. 
Uh, it's a consultation process. We also look at the technology route map. So feedback on that around how some people can access and will provide services through that process would be welcome. Given we've got rather low capacity of gas storage in the UK relative to, say, continental Europe, and given that, if I recall, in National Grid, uh, a significant capacity is stored under pressure in the transmission system, do you envisage, if Graham comes along with a real scale solution, that you have to change the capacity of the transmission system? So there, there is a, a limit in how much we can store in what's called line pack, which is just effectively the amount of gas we stuff into the big pipes that are, of the transmission system. Um, but there are, are plenty of opportunities for short range, medium range, long term storage. So on some of the scale, if we're talking about terawatt um, worth of storage, then we're looking at something that's you specific to the, that. Good. Uh, on the transmission network. We can move it on the transmission network. We can't store it directly in the transmission network, but there's plenty of opportunities mm -hmm. to do so. Yep. Can I ju yeah, just add something? As we're talking, we've talked about hydrogen storage and storage in the grid, which is really at transmission level. But it's worth remembering that there's also a role for storage at a distribution level and actually in the house as well. So if you think about sort of the peak demand we have for heating in our homes, one way in which we can meet that is by heating hot water um, and then using the heat from that in our radiators during peak demand periods. Now, in the UK at the moment, we've gone through a period of getting rid of hot water tanks, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the key storage elements in our system. So yeah. some of the decisions we make sort of uh, are not necessarily thought through in terms of the long-term um, impacts of them. Graham, did you want a final word on that? Yeah, sure. So, so today, uh, line, line pack aside, we've got 15 days of onshore um, uh, gas storage. Uh, 70 days of offshore storage at the rough store, which is owned by Centrica. Um, if you take Germany, for instance, they have 220 days of gas storage, um, primarily because they are concerned about um, gas and security of supply for obvious reasons now. We used to have 40 days, actually, of onshore storage. We closed a lot of it down. So I think um, uh, one of the things that is important is not to do any more of that, I would suggest. Uh, um, but look, we are curtailing wind. We curtail every plant every day if it's in the mid merit anyway. Um, and, and actually, we, this year, we met two quite emotive targets. Um, one was peak instantaneous power. For the first time, we turned down uh, one gigawatt of wind. Um, and over the year, we turned down one terawatt hour. So they're two quite big numbers that you should have in your head. And, and the reason they're worth having in your head is that there are actually 350 terawatt hours of energy f flowing through the electricity grid. So it's only 0.3% right now. But the point is, it's rising. And um, the reason it's only 0.3% is because this gentleman's company buys so many grid balancing services. So we have a preference in the UK for buying grid balancing services rather than turning down wind. So we're doing it in a commercial way. Um, but the problem is getting more significant. I'll take one more question from the floor. Yes, are there two more? I'll take the two, OK, if you're fast on your feet. Yeah. No, just a moment. The microphone's at the, behind you. Yeah. Hello. Take the gentleman who's got the microphone. Yeah, hello. Mike Hancock, D Associates. Um, with electrolysis, you've got two electrodes, so you've got two products. Have you discounted the benefits of your proposal by not including an analysis of the value of the byproduct? Yeah, thanks, Mike. The, the, um, the, the oxygen we just vent um, at the moment, uh, you can use it for cleaning water. You can use it for the fermentation process for, for um, uh, cleaning sewerage is one application. Um, um, oxygen uh, is quite easy to make with precious wind desorption. It's expensive to store and it's difficult to um, transport. So the only application for the oxygen is one on site. It also makes the electrolyzer system more expensive if you gather the oxygen because you've got the safety issues of oxygen which are far more significant than hydrogen. Next question, final one. 
Uh, Dale Carter. Um, how do you see government policy and private industry working out all the different technologies that we need to bring to the fore to make the continuing system develop, innovate, and improve for the future? And the other question, briefly, is do we have a politician in this room to be seeing these conversations? I can take that. We can get if, the messages yeah. through. Don't worry. If, Don't worry. if I go first on that one, um, I think the Energy Technologies Institute actually provides a very unique opportunity for that. So uh, we have six major energy and engineering companies, all of whom have a large presence in the UK, um, span oil and gas, electricity, gas generation, um, and the heavy industry of Rolls-Royce and Caterpillar. Um, and they sit around the ETI board, hand in hand basically with the government, um, not lobbying for their own technologies, um, not promoting whatever makes them most money, but actually looking at what makes, uh, h how we build the energy system together, public and private sector, how we move forward. And um, it's a form in which government very much listens to them. We don't just work with those six companies, though. We work at the moment, we have over 100 partners, um, other large companies. National Grid has worked with us on projects, um, down to um, a large amount of SMEs um, and colleagues in academia. So I think we need to look for building these solutions and building the future energy system isn't just the responsibility of policymakers. It isn't just the responsibility of the private sector. They do need to work together, and we need to harness the vast engineering resource that, and the skills that we have in the UK um, to develop the technologies and the solutions um, that we need out to the future. And if we do that, um, we're also in a very good position to export some of those technologies um, and resources and people skills that we will have developed. So I think a good example for me is the under our uh, price control with Ofgem, we, there is a, a fund available to us called the N Network Innovation Competition. So an example of uh, a project we're putting forward for a competition, um, it'll be in conjunction with um, academia as well as uh, uh, research and development companies um, and uh, distribution companies is looking at wide area control um, in the southeast for HVDC links all the way through to uh, local storage and a smart aspect within distribution networks. So by, by having funding set aside that Ofgem recognise that one of the ways of promoting collaboration across the industry is to fund these projects, um, to make it a co competition so you, you try and win and have a, a compelling case. Um, and by doing that, it encourages participation across all aspects of um, the, the, the supply chain, the value chain, that might deliver some future benefit. But it is not something that may be commercially viable today. So I think the simple message is we shouldn't just leave it to the politicians. I, I, think, that, I think that's absolutely right. We, we've had fantastic support from the TSB. Uh, um, and a number of projects have been funded by the TSB. Uh, it, the TSB projects developed our relationship with SSE and National Grid, for instance. Um, we, had to move, we had to go to Germany to do our first full-scale utility project. So there's, some, there's something there that need, we need to think about. Um, you, you try and engage with UK utilities, and it's not a TSB project or something funded by DEC, and you can forget it. They, they just can't bring themselves to do it. Um, now, in the UK, I, I worked for the CEGB very briefly before it was privatised and turned into national power. Uh, we demonstrated technologies all over the world and taught everybody what they needed to know. So I'm not advocating that approach, but I do think that utilities should be able to try new technologies without having to automatically think about the TSB DEC or the Low Carbon Networks Fund. All right, I think you've earned your cup of tea, thank so you. we will return back here at 3.40. So thank you very much indeed to our speakers.